Well, hi, Mutoni. It's very nice that you take the time to talk talking to us about Black History Month. And this the month of February has been celebrated as Black History Month since the 1970s. And what does this celebration mean to you personally? And have you celebrated now since this month is coming to an end? Thank you, Knut, for this invitation. Um, I'm excited to be here with you and uh, to talk about uh, a month that is of incredible personal importance, uh, as well as national importance. Uh, I'm someone who grew up in a household where I was often uh, dressing as historical Black figures, even as a three-year-old. So uh, I came from the kind of house that really uh, embraced and lifted up um, the place of African Americans in this country. Uh, and in a household that wanted to grow uh, that kind of pride uh, early on. Understanding that um, while we had black history, even uh, when I was a girl, that um, it wasn't necessarily uh, executed in the same way across all of the public schools uh, in America, nor um, you know, in people's sort of home spaces per se. Um, it has been a holiday that in terms of its level of impact has really developed over time. And I think with a lot of really great people uh, of all backgrounds who um, understood the importance of getting history as correct as we can. Um, mm. And really going back to, um, to create a more uh, truthful and inclusive history of this country. Um, and that is part of the power of what Black History Month has done. And uh, I did celebrate it by kicking it off um, with something that I thought lived sort of inside of my, my wheelhouse at the time. So, you know, I just left my job as the National Political and Organizing Director for the Democratic National Committee. And we now have a new chairman uh, Jamie Harrison, mm -hmm. uh, who has taken over the party. He is the second African-American uh, to be the chair of the Democratic National Committee. Um, prior to that, we had a gentleman named Ron Brown, um, who is somebody that I met very early on. I was a senior in high school in New York when the Democratic Convention came to New York. And mm. I would not really thought about the party. I didn't I grew up in a household of people who always believed in voting, um, but, you know, and, and we were community activists, but the idea of the party is a very different thing, as you know, from being engaged or active, right? And, um, and so that was my first introduction to the party, and it was when they had their first African-American chair, and he was something to behold. I mean, he was just very, very uh, magnetic person, and uh, I had the opportunity to uh, staff his sort of, they had their own sort of personal uh, lounge uh, inside of this, the, the Madison Square Garden Arena. And every historical figure that I'd ever read about was coming through there from Dr. Dorothy Height to Reverend Jesse Jackson to so many of the elected officials of that day. Um, and other luminaries, writers, poets, all of these people. So I had this like explosion moment, mm -hmm. right? Um, experiencing what it was like to have this black chairman and therefore who that that also helped to bring out and around the party. Uh, and now, you know, from there to this moment, uh, I celebrated uh, Ron Brown, I I'm sorry, I should say Jamie Harrison is, is our third African-American chair. Uh, Donna Brazil was our second, uh, and then Jamie Harrison uh, is our third. And Donna Brazil stepped forward uh, to help take over the party when it was in a lot of trouble uh, and when we were going through great turmoil. So celebrating these three great leaders in our party for me was the best way I could think to kick off Black History Month. Yeah, that is a tremendous story. And I mean, of course, we hope that Jamie Harrison will 
will have a, a well, lot of opportunities to show his leadership and, and his strength. And I, he did a tremendous campaign in South Carolina. He did, right? he did. Uh, so that it's, a, and I mean, when we talk about black history, I mean, it is really, it is, it comes from slavery and then it comes to emancipation in the 19th century. Then there comes this backlash. And then after the second world war, well, well like a lot happens. It's like, it's a struggle. It's somewhat a gruesome struggle, at least looking from the outside. And then there is a civil rights moment, but somehow how important is it today in the public perception of American history? And how is this history taught in American high schools, for instance? Black history, like all history, evolves as we learn more. Where it may have once started at slavery, once the discovery that there were Black people who landed here before slavery, who were explorers like so many others, um, then we start to create an, a longer paradigm and a more inclusive story uh, of a world, really, that, you know, there was a limited story about so many of us in the world. Uh, and we have all begun to continue to sort of expand who we were um, as discoveries become more and more prevalent. Uh, and Slavery, uh, though, in terms of numbers, uh, absolutely. Um, and in terms of the, um, the, the violent beginnings of this country's um, economy, uh, mm -hmm. really, this was an economic uh, uh, decision that I think is an incredibly important through point when you think about the, the, the intentionality of oppression um, and when you think about a colonial structure that was very intent on not only um, uh, uh, utilizing human beings as a part of um, uh, 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 as as a part of of how money was made, but um, yeah, obviously there were indentured servants and others for whom sort of loaded almost no wage was also. Uh, a part of the reality of their lives as well. And, and making sure that these two groups were never going to get to a place where they would somehow band together was a very, very important part of what you now see, even in terms of when you ask, why are there poor people who would still support someone like Donald Trump or re support a Republican party that doesn't support them in any way, shape, or form economically um, has been an intentional division that was laid quite early. It was layered even inside of the slavery um, uh, structure uh, from the overseer and who that person was in the sort of strata, right? In the social strata uh, and all the way down. Um, and so all of these, all of the, the complex pieces of how you try to maintain an oppressive system uh, that is um, that that is a major way that money is being made um, also reflects in the social structure, right? Mm -hmm. And then reflects in um, this what has been carried forward. So. Um, look at today's struggle and you see poverty and you see the disparity overwhelmingly living inside of communities of color. Um, but right next to that, you will see uh, many of these sort of same pockets of poor white people. Um, and then certainly inside of like newer, um, uh, our, some of our newer immigrant uh, spaces as well. Well, what are the things that have contributed to that? Um, housing. There are lots of mechanisms that can keep people in a particular space. And there are so many ways in which we have now finding ourselves needing to fight for reform, which is why Joe Biden and part of what the communities were saying 
to uh, him as he was running uh, to leave this country was our expectations as we move forward into this next iteration are that we don't need to have this same conversation yet again. That equity is not possible if you don't acknowledge that we're not all starting at the same place on the starting line. And you will have to acknowledge the systemic pieces of our economy, of our structure, of our government that have, have, um, have been a, a willing part of this. Um, and that's everything from our agro economy to our industrial economy. And it is everything from our housing to our banking to our education and schools. All of it is inside of a systemic, um, uh, all of it is, none of it has escaped sort of the systemic racism that exists here. And so, you know, that is, and, and, and a part of how, how we fix that is uh, that those of us who have experienced these things firsthand, but also are experts in the field, uh, ought to be at the decision-making tables. And that is a big part of what we are demanding around inclusiveness in government, inclusiveness in uh, corporate, inclusiveness in higher education, in, in the higher jobs and education in these management roles. So black history right now is continuing to be made. I told a middle school class that I don't know what exactly they are learning in the high schools, but I know it's got you know, much of it is better than what was taught during my time. I will say that. I can say mm -hmm. from my own son's school that mm -hmm. they are, you know, I mean, that they were having very real discussions about Black Lives Matter. Um, and, you know, because race right now is something that no longer can sort of be contained in one space. And, and there are children everywhere asking about what's happening on the nightly news. Um, this has brought us to a very, very different place, and it is a very important and good place to be uh, in order for reform to take place. Yeah, I mean, for, I mean, obviously the Afro-American community has contributed a lot to the strength, to the prosperity, to the thriving of the United States, and I mean, mm. this somewhat surprising and disturbing that there is still such a huge political and social division inside of the United States. Mm -hmm. How do you think you can overcome this division? Yeah, well, I believe in, in reparations. I believe that there is, uh, I think that there uh, are economic reparations that are owed mm -hmm. uh, and that there are specific, um, there are specific areas of our um, industries and economies where you can go and apply that immediately, starting with the agricultural industry, a place where Black farmers were so intentionally disenfranchised and sort of kept out of um, so many opportunities that, in, and, and, and as we all know, farmers struggle as it is. It is not an easy um, it is not an easy endeavor to be a part of and family farms and we have seen sort of you know smaller farms really suffer at the hands of big agriculture um but in addition to that um what we know now is that we have an opportunity to create the kind of bold legislation that would really not it doesn't just acknowledge it's not an apology it is more than that. It is, it's got to, I mean, it, it, all of this helped make you something. So then what are you doing on the other side of this to say, I need to take what was made and I need to re, I need to give that back. Mm. <laughs> um, and I need to do that in a way, obviously that smart people will get around and they will figure it out. But to make it a ludicrous idea is absolutely insulting. Um, we have seen it done. We see we do it all the time in uh, class action suits um, and in 
uh, legal decisions that are made when people have been harmed, whether it's tobacco or whether they have been harmed by medical malpractice. And I don't understand then where the notion would come in that there was not a way to um, move investment back where, uh, where, where things were freely taken. So, um, so I think that is one thing. I think that another place is, again, you know, as much as we will say things like inclusion, um, it is very, it, it, it has been, and this is, this is something that I think is very important inside of our own parties, Knut. And this mm. is, first and foremost, my husband who's from the Netherlands uh, says you have to clean your, your own yard first, right? And a part of, big part of what I went over to do inside of my party was to help model what inclusivity actually looks like, how it needs to function. And I think that, you know, I'm a, a, a pebble along the way. Um, and I hope that I was successful in doing that. I think that we demonstrated what it, what it then produces uh, in terms of engagement, in terms of credibility, in terms of interest and in terms of expansion. <laughs> so um, it's all a win-win, but it means for some people in their minds that they don't get to hire their friends. <laughs> <Anyway>. <laughs> so you do have to make room and you yeah. don't do things in the same way. Well, our industries have been very much cottage industries. Um, from the way that we have, that people may even get hired in government to inside of our own parties. And we have a lot of sway over all of the rest of this. And if we're not modeling it inside of our own spaces, then why would we ask existential questions about how these things get done in other places? Mm. We make policy. We are on television. We are out here. We are front and forward. We are the political trust space uh, that is supposed to be leading. We help set the tone. And I think that it is really important, um, again, for me in Black History Month, the reason why I kicked it off talking about my own, you know, the leaders inside of our party, I wanted to demonstrate and showing these three incredible people. These were people who all helped bring some extreme richness to, to the party. Mm. I'd like to not see it ebb and flow based on whether you have a black chair, but rather that this is something that becomes a normalized way of, of how we as a party, our culture uh, and who we are. So um, yeah, so I these are the ways that I think that we can take action. I There's a lot to bite off when we talk about the country at large, but there's places that we as parties can begin. Um, and the place that we begin is to say, who are we running for office? Who are we recruiting? Who's on our tickets? Who are our senior leadership people? Who is it that I am hiring around us? Who's running the meetings? Who is in charge of budgets? All of those incredibly important questions. And when you look around and you say, does this look like America? Does this look like Germany today? We need to keep pushing ourselves for the answer to be yes in each of the spaces that we all are in charge of. That's it's very important what you're saying. And it's, it's very universal. I mean, at, at least in democratic societies that we need to yeah. push our own selves and that we need to uh, work in our, in our own political environment to make sure that we do really represent what is today's society and not something else, you know, it's not something from the past. I mean, I would say that uh, our party also would have a lot of work to do there. And uh, because Germany has changed also tremendously um, in the last um, 50 years. But like staying now in the US, like, I mean, I visited in, in December, I visited Atlanta and Savannah because I, we were very interested uh, in the election in Georgia, but also, of course, the legacy of uh, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. is mm -hmm. something that 
is somehow very much on our mind in his speech 58 years ago, I have a dream uh, given on the National Mall in front of the Lincoln Memorial is the, somehow a very powerful image. And, but I wonder like how important is his legacy today in the political fight uh, or in the, let's not call it struggle, uh, let's call it struggle or however you wanna call it. Um, and how, well, how can you advance his legacy today? And I mean, one thing that struck me very much when I visited his memorial is really that, that his way was really a non-violent way. I mean, that was very important to him and, and also in differentiation to other leaders at the time. So I wonder how important that is today, his legacy. His legacy, his true legacy is incredibly important and it is alive and it is breathing inside of our current movements. Mm. Our current movements are nonviolent movements. Black Lives Matter is a nonviolent movement. It is a nonviolent protest movement that has put tremendous pressure in its efficacy in its ability to have attracted so many people from across identities um, to join in raising their voices in uh, writing letters in putting their bodies out on the streets in times where unfortunately it was often law enforcement that made these situations dangerous and not the other way around or there were uh, random people that sort of try to infiltrate these moments and give it a bad name. But uh, none of that leadership has ever pushed forward in any way a violent solution to our problems. And I know that many people sort of only have one side, Dr. King. And there's been sort of an intentional softening of him. Mm -hmm. We actually find problematic. He was a man who was extremely, uh, not, not just serious, but, but extremely progressive. And there was a, a, he was revolutionary in what he was saying. But a lot of that has been softened down to make it something that would pull pieces of his speech and instead try to lull particularly people who are, um, who, who may, if you are looking at what is going on around you, outrage should be a natural reaction to that. And Dr. King is not looking for people to go and just recite his speeches somewhere. He was not just a beautiful orator, he was, physically out there on the front lines, marching in the face of absolute violence. He was jailed. He was, uh, and, and this was a strategy over and over again to demonstrate um, the fact that there was this much resistance and that regular people needed to understand that this was not just about black people needing to like speak up or write a letter and that would get, there was, resistance to change that was coming from inside of the institutions that we pay taxes to that mm. should be protecting us. And so his legacy, um, everything from being anti-war to um, having gone and been one of the strongest people to stand with working people and labor folk, that was before he was killed he was supposed to be with sanitation workers striking in Memphis, Tennessee. So his story is often mistold mm -hmm. and it is told in the way that it should be in that this man was a radical and he was a radical who had a very diplomatic way of approaching the work. But nonetheless, at that time, being anti-war was a radical stance. It was as radical as Congresswoman Barbara Lee, a black woman from California, being
being the only member of Congress to not decide to go to war after 9-11. We are both in, a, in Washington, D.C., and Washington, D.C. is, of course, a very, in many ways, a very special place and, and a place I personally like very much. Yeah. And it has a, a, a also a very to interesting history and a large and strong um, black middle class and legendary cultural, educational, and political institutions. But if we want to look at one specific in institution that you uh, know, I think also very well, Howard University, which and also now the um, Vice President Kamala Harris is also is also her alma mater. It's your alma mater. Maybe we can talk uh, briefly about how th that institution is an an epic center and historic home for education, and but also for political action in the uh, black Absolutely. community. Absolutely. But maybe well, that's why I went there. Explain that a little bit. How it <laughs> is. How how it is that way. Yeah. Um, well, you know, uh, so Howard has been also known as the Black Mecca, uh, meaning that this was a place, I guess, where you know, so many thought leaders and um, people who I think felt a bit restless, frankly, uh, around um, politics and, but also around other areas of leadership. Uh, and there were so many that came out of here, Dr. Charles Drew. I mean, so we've broken barriers in science. We've broken barriers in entertainment uh, and the arts. And, uh, you know, obviously we also have professional schools. We have a law school, we have a medical school. So having sort of that full, um, that, that full offering has really made Howard a very, very rich place for people um, to come and to uh, be able to not only uh, not only to learn um, from their professors, but um, to learn from one another. I think that the sort of student body itself comes to DC, and um, and I will tell you, a lot of these students are coming from perhaps majority white environments. Not all of them, many of them, are not coming from schools where or neighborhoods or environments where they have been um, surrounded by black people, black culture, et cetera. So there are, are several layers of learning and, um, and, and sort of saturation, I guess, that uh, is very reinforcing. Um, you have to remember in, uh, and particularly, you know, things are changing now in the information age and as, as as we are helping to continue to sort of move change and we are seeing more and more diversity in imagery in movies, et cetera. But I mean, even in my time going to college, it was such a struggle to see yourself um, represented in the larger sort of American paradigm of excellence. Uh, you certainly weren't in very many commercials. You were not in very many movies that told stories uh, that weren't, that did not portray you as a criminal or as a prostitute uh, or as, uh, you know, as the joke. Um, so, or as a person that got killed early on in the horror movies. So, so you know, all of these things matter to a, a, um, a sense of morale and place. Uh, and, um, and that has been done by design. Uh, again, um, that absence, that erasure. And you go to these historically Black institutions, Howard being one of, of, of many that exist, and we thank God for them because they have truly helped many of us to uh, go and to have four years of a little bit of a break, <laughs> four years of intense learning, a, a, a much more truthful approach to our history, but also to these subject matters. So when you go and you learn math, um, learning about more than, uh, uh, no offense, than, than the, the German mathematician, but to learn a, a larger paradigm, right, about who have been the great thinkers in these different 
subject areas? Who has helped to move things forward? Well, it turns out a whole hell of a lot of people whose names that many of us have never heard and should. Um, we've had a very one-sided education and going to a historically black college and university helped to fill our education out. And then it puts inside of you this foundation that is very difficult to crack, this belief in yourself and in what we as a people can do and what we ought to, what we deserve, um, you know, and, and which is every bit the same as the next person, that's all. <laughs> uh, and you take that with you forward into your careers where you come again into a world that does not see it that way. And, um, and that has been very important for a lot of people's ability to thrive. And so you see someone now um, uh, like Vice President Harris, who I have to tell you, Knut, when we would go to HBC, when we would choose those schools, some of us would come up against you know, advisors who would say, but that's not the real world. Or are you sure you don't wanna go to you know, this other institution? And so we now know that hopefully the next young person will not have to uh, explain their choice anymore mm. about why they want to go to Howard or why they want to go to Fisk or why they want to go to Prairie View um, and so many others, but that it is understood that this is as great an institution of higher learning as any other. Mm. Thank you very much. Now, if, if we, of course, we uh, all were very excited, I think, about uh, Joe Biden becoming president and about uh, Kamala Harris becoming vice president. And, um, but at the same time, it is also, the whole world is curious how they're gonna fill uh, also the expectations that, that basically are with them now after, four years that were very, very difficult to say the least. And since you have been working with um, then Senator Biden's uh, campaign in 2008 as a deputy political director, you, I think you probably have more insight than other people in what is potentially happening. And, and I mean, there are, he has a very big agenda, but as I think an important part of the agenda is also how to really change the US to serve justice, to use that big word, and to really do something about the inequalities and the injustices that the Black Lives Matter movement has brought, let's say, to a broader attention and, and is fighting for. So I wonder how you see that, what, what, what Joe Biden as a president can do and achieve realistically in the next two years, because he, he, that's basically when the next Congress is being voted, of course, he will be president for four years, but he has now these two years with a majority in the House of Representatives and a, a tight majority in, in, in the Senate. What do you think yeah. he's going to no, I Well, look, I, I'll tell you this. Um, it has to happen. There, there, there will have to be changes that people can feel, not mm. changes that you tell them, but they will, there will have to be changes that people can feel. Um, I, can, I could feel in this last election that there are communities that were basically saying, you've got this one more chance to prove to us, Democratic Party, that you are actually a vehicle for me. Um, and I felt that uh, throughout different communities. I felt it particularly salient in the Black community. Um, and I think that this is all very doable. Georgia made it doable. I don't think it is, um, I think it's very important to state that this administration is here because of a historic um, 
voting block that was the most diverse in this in the history of this country. And so that is a voting block that is going to expect to feel change in their lives. And that is going to be, um, it, it is a tall order, but that's why you have all these different agencies working at the same time. And the thing that I loved about the Biden plans was that they had continuity in them, that they didn't sort of just have climate change living inside of the EPA. It went from agency to agency where it would also need to be in the Justice Department and in these other places where if we're talking about a social, a, a, yes, a climate action agenda that has to include social justice in that uh, because some of the hardest hit areas are, are, are poor areas, are our areas where black and brown people um, frankly have been traded on you know, for industry uh, to have its way in a lot of these areas and have left people um, either you know, dying or in terrible health or any number of other conditions. So I have, I, I come into it very optimistic because you, they wrote plans that acknowledged where the, how the work needs to happen and that it has to happen across the different agencies and obviously inside of the White House itself. And you know, we saw that in the executive orders that were signed quickly. Um, I, they came in wanting to make sure that this was hard hitting. Uh, he's got the Senate. Yes, it's narrow, but we have the majority. People will expect to see something out of this House and Senate majority, along with having the White House. Um, and the last thing I'll say on that is that we've got um, an administration and a party whose job it is to work in, as, in concert as much as we can. Like the key to us being able to deliver on large, big things is that we have strong working relationships that are healthy, that are high producing, that are highly communicative, and where we are not only doing the thing, but we're telling our story about how we did it and where we did it. And we make sure people know we did it. Um, that is obviously the two parts of this, which is you have the Biden policy side of this, and then you have our party whose job it is to make sure that it is telling the story of what Democrats are doing every day. Well, thank you, Mudoni, for that sharing your insights, your experience, and also your very personal um, well, history with us and uh, with me and it was a very, very very moving conversation and also a very interesting conversation and i hope of course that there will be a time where we can do that in person again I know. it's like i miss that very much mm. but thank you very much and i wish you all the best thank you absolutely thank you